Good morning. Uh, I'm Michael Casey. As, as Jason said, I'm a partner with uh, the Oblon firm in Alexandria, Virginia, right across the street from the patent office. Uh, my background is electrical and computer engineering, and uh, I have the distinct pleasure of, of sitting down with Joe Woody. I met him a little bit before the presentation, and, and I can echo what Jason said. He's a very approachable guy, and, and I'm looking forward to hearing about his experience. So, Well, thank you. Good morning. And good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. So, Joe, uh, I, as I've reviewed everything, you have a tremendous career spanning 30 years. Can you take us through parts of your career path and how you got into medical devices? Well, first of all, I'm going to have Jason introduce me wherever I go. That was uh, awfully nice and over, over the top. Um, my career started right out of university with General Electric Medical Systems. I went into sales of mammography uh, and ultrasound, and after that, uh, I had various experiences and in, in, in companies in sales and sales management, but probably the most significant role that, that put me on the path of my career was general manager of the clinical therapies business for Smith and & Nephew. And that was a $60 million business uh, that everybody had kind of given up on. We quickly grew it to $200 million um, in about a two-year period. It's now BioVentus. Uh, located uh, in Raleigh. It's been spun out from Smith and & Nephew. And one of our board members, Bill Hawkins, who I think is also going to be speaking uh, in a fireside chat in Raleigh soon, uh, is the chairman of that business. That kind of led to a, a two-level jump uh, to uh, become the global president of the wound care business at, at Smith and & Nephew. And I moved overseas and, and had an opportunity to do a turnaround on the wound care business that was negative growth. Uh, we had margin problems in the business. We got it to growth. Uh, I was able to have the experience with the team in building a factory in Suzhou, China, uh, and taking a lot of cost out of that business, and that was a great experience, which actually led to me being recruited by Joe Almeida, who is now the CEO of Baxter, to form the vascular business uh, at Covidian. And I have to say that that was very impactful to work alongside of Joe Almeida. At the time, Rich Melia was the CEO, and then Joe became CEO. Other folks like Amy Wendell, who was head of strategy and BD and is well known in our industry and now on uh, many boards, including uh, Baxter, Chuck Dockendorf, who's an excellent CFO. We acquired EV3 and built that business out, and that led to uh, being recruited by Apex Partners, a private equity firm out of London, to become the CEO of KCI LifeCell, which you all may be familiar with. We rebranded uh, Acelity. And I was their CEO for six years, and uh, we were able to exit a big piece of the business, which was life sale and a sale to Allergan. Uh, and then I um, left the company after six years and was really going to take a year off uh, and was heading literally out for a vacation. And when I landed the plane, I got a phone call from uh, uh, John Mitchell, who's a recruiter well known in our industry, who said, you know, how your health CEO is retiring. And uh, I thought, wow, this is a, an excellent opportunity. I heard a little bit about the strategy that was being contemplated in divesting uh, the SNIP business and trying to develop a pure play medical device uh, company. And I got very excited about it. Uh, and this has been about a year and 10 months or so uh, living in, in Alpharetta right here uh, in this uh, city, uh, in this position. One little closing comment that's so funny about that is that, you know, when I was reading some of the bios and you start seeing, you know, 30 years experience and this and that, and you think, man, I was sitting in an ER with my wife in Charleston over the weekend. She cut her finger uh, slicing an avocado, cut the, severed her artery and the nerve and cut down to the bone. So in, in, in the ER, I was talking to two plastic surgeon residents that were, you know, sewing up the artery and, and talking to her about getting a surgery. Uh, this week or next to see if they can't repair uh, the uh, the nerve. We came into the ER with her hand stuffed in a Covidian bag of ice, and uh, that started the conversation, and we started talking about all the Covidian products that they use and the sequential compression devices, the vascular products. So we talked then about LifeCell, and they use the Provena uh, system for closing wounds and the VAC therapy system uh, for open abdomens and abthera. Uh, and then I, you know, started talking about OnQ, our post-surgical um, product for uh, uh, acute pain after surgery, which is bupivacaine and ropivacaine, and they use OnQ. And then I left to come home. My wife stayed back to go to the clinic to have her dressing changed, and on her way in, she took a photo uh, of Alliance Imaging, a, a mobile MR system. I was the West uh, Coast Operations uh, VP for Alliance Imaging, so it's really interesting when you're asked to 
go through all of that and you think about 30 years or you go visit, I also have a sister in the hospital right now and our products are being used. She's using it as a closed section uh, respiratory tube uh, for a uh, ventilator and uh, antral feeding right now, unfortunately. But uh, it's amazing when you think about it, um, how all those products do touch people and you're never able to not have a conversation about it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate with all you've got going on, being able to be here and, yeah. and share your experience with us. I hope your wife gets better. Yeah, she will. Yeah. yeah. So um, in all of the, that career though, I mean, you've, you've done a lot of things. What do you think is your, your greatest uh, accomplishment so far in, in uh, your career? I mean, people ask me that question a lot. I, you know, the, the thing is, first of all, it's always a, a team that's doing these things. It's just not one individual. Um, it's, a, it's a team approach and, and the opportunities are very different. But what makes me the most happy about my career is the people that have worked on my teams that have become CEOs themselves or they're now board members or they're involved in uh, venture capital. And that also ties to something that we all do that not everybody in business does, which is the, the patients. And for us, we have our vision of getting patients back to the things that matter. So that, that is one thing. If I picked a couple of milestones, and I'll come back to what I think about that you know, achievement, will become the greatest achievement. Um, you know, things like the, the uh, uh, formation of the vascular business um, at Covidian en enabled an acquisition of EV3 it was a high value driver for the reason I think that Medtronic looked at buying Covidian, and that's, that's something that I point to. Uh, Jason was referring to KCI, you know, unfortunately KCI went through competitive bidding, lost over 200 million in pricing, and we had to restructure the business and get that business back to growth, and get LifeCell moving and, and exited, that was certainly uh, formidable. Um, what is now by Aventus early on was a great experience for me too though because uh, you know we rapidly grew that business and it's now thriving and they're considering you know whether or not they look at IPOs or things like that now so that's a very exciting uh, thing. But actually I think the greatest achievement is yet to come because I think I'm in the middle of it right now. and. Uh, you know, when I looked at this opportunity and saw that we could be a $650 million business, we could rebrand, we could create whatever we wanted in terms of our culture and innovation and have the kind of capacity for M&A at the size of company that we are at $650 million revenue. And the energy and passion that our board has about, who all, by the way, are, are uh, in their own right legends in our, in, in our industry and have massive accomplishments, leave a medical device company uh, in the space that can thrive and be uh, well-known and, and maybe see some of the successes of a Teleflex, uh, you know, or a Bard or other companies. That won't be me finishing that off, but it might be a successor or an even another successor uh, beyond me. But I do think that that's likely, the, currently the Avenus experience, uh, likely to be the, uh, the greatest accomplishment. And all of my colleagues that are sitting in the, in the, in the uh, audience right now might be thinking, really? You know, because you, you obviously have challenges in business, you have good times and bad times, but the, in the long haul, I think that's going to be true. Oh. Well, what's clear from all the stuff I've read about you is that patients are a real key factor for you. And I know that uh, there's a big push, uh, shift in the healthcare, healthcare industry towards involving patients much more in, in their care than has happened in the past. And pain management is something that everyone understands. And, and uh, even a quick review of your website shows you're very engaged with the patient. How, can you, how have you done this? And what advice do you have for companies looking to improve their patient interactions? Well, for us, it, it starts with um, our vision, which is getting patients back to the things that matter. I, I, and I, I say that that really has energized uh, our employee base, but it also um, allows for the right conversation on strategy or decisions that we make uh, in investments. Um, the first thing I would say, to get close to the patient, you have to get close to the customers, and that means the, the KOL boards and the scientific advisory boards, and understand what their challenges are and help yourself get connected uh, to the patient. Specifically for our business, there are a couple of, uh, of uh, areas that you know, we're doing direct to patient advertising for our Cooley product and uh, educating patients on uh, treatment for uh, osteoarthritis of the knee and uh, doing clinical studies because we believe uh, you know, that it's a much better, uh, op uh, much better procedure than hyaluronic acid. Um, and then you know, helping those patients navigate to the right payer and to the right uh, trained uh, physician the other thing is, um, you know, our chronic care business is very important to people. A lot of pediatric patients need enteral feeding and, and it starts as an infant and, and continues as life progresses. And so we, we put a social uh, 
media network together where you know parents are on there talking about their experiences and what they're doing um, and they're talking about you know the products and giving us ideas and thoughts about uh, about that um, I think because of the nature of what we're in and the uh, in the interventional pain space the acquisitions we want to make the breakthrough innovation that we want to bring to the market you'll see more of that from us and I also think that you know when I say our size a company whether that's a a mid-sized company or, or you know, some of you in the audience are startups, it's a way to differentiate yourself uh, because the larger companies at the moment, they're getting better, uh, aren't as adept in that area and you can move more quickly. Yep. Well, you certainly have seemed to have moved very quickly in your, in your experiences so far. So in terms of movements, let's that talk about I have to say credit to the team. I mean, they were already on that journey before I got there. We're just sort of enhancing it now. But it, it's definitely working positively for us. I mean, just one example before we move on. Where we've done the direct-to-patient to uh, advertising, uh, we're seeing a 35% lift in procedures in our accounts. So it's, it's pretty positive. I think working for you must be phenomenal because you, you're giving credit to your team all the time. I, I got, I'm going to take lessons on <laughs> make sure I give team give credit to my team. So anyway, transition to Avenos. You had a great tenure at KCI and accomplished a tremendous amount in just six years. Uh, how did you uh, weigh the opportunity of taking over um, Halyard? Well, so as I as I landed uh, to take, I was going to take a year off, like everybody kind of wants to do. If you ever get a chance to do that, it's you know, and it didn't only lasted about uh, two months. But when I looked at our board of directors after talking to John Mitchell. I saw Ron Dollins uh, as, the, as the chairman, and, and obviously Ron was the chairman and CEO of, of uh, Guidant and has been chairman of a number of uh, medical device companies. Bill Hawkins, um, just as another example, who is very uh, focused in the southeast and, again, chairman of Bioventus and, and on many, many boards and involved in venture capital, someone like a Dr. Julie Scheimer. Um, and Gary Blackford was on the interview committee. I've now got a chance to know uh, Patrick O'Leary. Um, but uh, I thought, wow, these are powerhouse uh, ex-CEOs for the most part. We have a nice balance of diversity on the board also um, with Heidi Koontz and Maria Saint. Uh, and we've, we've won some awards for that. Um, I just thought they really want to make a mark. That's what I want to do. I mean, I want to make a mark, but I want to make a mark where I've got an opportunity because as we all know, organic growth is, is, is difficult to sustain. So you have to have you know, an ability to make acquisitions uh, in a company our size and even a smaller uh, company. So for me, it was an easy, um, an easy decision. It was also a chance to, to move from private equity uh, to a publicly traded uh, uh, company environment, uh, which is a nice, I think, a nice uh, uh, component for me in, in my career on, on a personal level. Um, and, uh, and it was an easy decision. Well, you certainly make it sound easy. What, what surprised you most about the company? I think for me, as I looked into it, and you know how you, when you do these things, you interview, you kind of get your business plan together. We interviewed by a committee, and it was almost you know, like, bring your business plan. What would you do uh, with the company? I was really surprised by the number one, number two market positions of most of the products uh, in, in the markets. And I could see that if we sort of put an effort into international, that we could get a lot of growth uh, there. And frankly, you know, Kimberly-Clark, I guess a $20 billion company, um, Ma mainly consumer goods. This division was smaller. We sort of didn't get the investment that you would get in a pure play medical device company. So I could see that, uh, and we've been talking on our, our, on our calls and to our investors about investing in clinical studies, uh, reimbursement, um, some things in, in channel and obviously international that we could really get to a top quartile organic growth. Um, but anyway, I was very surprised, uh, you know, in particular in the chronic care and how I'm really excited about Coolies is going to be a real catalyst for our business. Uh, just surprised that the products are so outstanding, so a great base to work from. Great. Um, what did you think was your most challenging moment, though? You know, the, the, um, we this year, I mean, on the, the, the first half of 2018, we were on a rocket ship with our stock. I mean, we were trading in the 70s. Um, the, you know, business was growing high single digits very quickly, much more quickly than I think a lot of investors would have thought. In our space, in the Anki space, the, uh, the pain pump, we sell the pumps. We don't sell the drug uh, and we don't fill. But there were a lot of regulatory actions with Pfizer on uh, Lopivacaine and Bupivacaine uh, and with um, Farmidium, uh, which is a, a division uh, of Amerisource Bergen, and they shut down. 
and so we were unable to get sales into our customers at the level that we would like and keep the pace of growth up. Uh, so we're now, you know, just even though that's not our supply chain, we're, we're working very hard to be innovative in that space to uh, bring that market uh, back, and uh, we've talked to our investors about that uh, coming in the second uh, half of the year. Um, but look, I mean, that happens in business, right? You know, it's not, it's things, uh, generally, you've got to have an organization that can overcome those challenges, that can see, and you have to be able to articulate as a, as a management team, the longer term view of what you're achieving. And uh, obviously, if you can maintain that credibility, you can work your way through something like that. Well, I think everyone has heard about the opioid crisis in the U.S. And in December, Avanos was selected as one of eight winners of the FDA's Opioid Addiction Innovation Challenge. Can you tell us about the challenge, the product that you submitted, and in general, the state of the medical devices helping to overcome the opioid yeah. crisis? Yeah, there were over 250 submissions. And so I think Lou Burns somewhere here in, in the, he's very involved in some, somewhere probably in the crowd. Um, he and his team uh, put this uh, project forward. Uh, it got approved. Od oddly enough, I know we're talking a lot about what are the strengths of the Southeast. Uh, one of the pieces that we're working on is that at, at Duke uh, as a data collection area. And it's really about helping um, anesthesiologists be able to better visualize uh, through AI uh, nerves replacing catheters for um, pain pumps uh, in, the, in a surgical procedure. And uh, just, a, just a, a great win for the team. Um, that's sort of initiated from uh, Lee and his team uh, building a pain center of excellence just down the street here where I think there's 12 or so PhDs that we hired uh, you know, to work on breakthrough technologies uh, in our business. And um, you know, it's exciting for us. And in, in our investor conference, we talked about uh, two or three more uh, that we'd like. One is an e-block that might uh, give us an opportunity to, to, to do blocks in a different way uh, than uh, long-lasting locals or even uh, pain pumps today. Excellent. So in just two years, you've already transformed Avano significantly. Uh, this must have taken a lot of work to get alignment with employees, stockholders, your board. Can you tell us about the process and how do you lead in a time of transition to get alignment and agreement with so many interested in individuals? I think there's a lot of people with smaller companies that like to know how you manage this. I'm a big believer in alignment and focus. And I learned that throughout my career. And uh, when we purchased EV3 at Covidian, we actually sort of, in a way, reverse integrated and brought some of their culture uh, into Covidian. And one of the things was uh, high performance management system or HPMS. And what that's all about is getting your board of directors and investors your customers and your employees all on the same page about what the vital few are uh, to your business, the four or five things that are gonna drive the needle where you'll put 70% of your investment um, and 70% of your time, and it really instructs the day-to-day -day with an employee base to make them a part of the strategy. Um, you survey uh, those constituents every six months, um, and uh, you, you, you map that over with your strategy, and you come up with uh, you know metrics then to measure. We actually took a page out of uh, Alan Mullaly's book on, if you've read that book, you know, on the turnaround of Ford, where every other week, and this week it'll be Thursday, we do a business process review and look at all the red lights and green lights and yellow lights, and then we have a special attention review of red lights in the afternoon and get the management team all in one room and solve those problems there, which enables speed and engagement uh, in, in the process and, and uh, in, in the business. Um, you also develop your values out of that, and it teaches the organization a way to use facts and job tickets to, uh, with cross-functional uh, work that's uh, a little bit like Six Sigma, uh, asking the why, 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 until you get uh, the current state ironed out and to root cause, and then eventually to breakthrough. Um, and it takes a couple of years to get that embedded in an organization uh, of our size, but again, I think uh, without a process like that, um, a lot of people pull the rope in different ways. You may not be aligned with your board. You may not be aligned with your investors uh, or your customers. Uh, but that constant surveying and, and there's some high bars that you're trying to reach at the, you know, 100% willingness to recommend a friend or family member for an employee for the employee engagement. But if you get sort of over, you know, 75% or so, you're getting to, you know, best in, in class. Um, so that's the process I use. Sounds to me like th one of the things you've learned is when it's time to pivot. So after working on uh, the buy-in at the start, and now you need to realign, is there a process 
is, is the process the same or is there new challenges when you're trying to pivot in, in the marketplace and, and how do you work through those? Well, one thing is for sure, and I'm sure everybody experiences it just from watching news cycles now or um, the way people communicate with social media, but you, you, you walk out of the boardroom with your strategy and it may have to change two weeks or e four weeks or, or three months from where you are. And what I like about this HPMS process is every six months you revisit the strategy. Um, and you can actually change the strategy, and you have to sometimes change the strategy. You know, we are going to go through that process ourselves, um, and we go go to our board in, in uh, end of July with our strategy session. Um, and you, you're getting that feedback and information and fact base, and able to change your overarching strategy, or even make slight tweaks or major uh, transformational changes uh, in that. But I mean, the, the, in that question, the one thing I think everybody probably already realizes in the room is that. You know, strategy is um, is dynamic. It's not static, and it's constantly changing. And so that engagement every other week, that process, um, that transparency allows you to shift and move. Um, and you just can't you can't be in today's world kind of locked into this is my five year strategy, and I'm not going to move from it because you'll just get run over. I understand. So. Um, You've been in a lot of cities during your career, but this is the first time you are in the southwest, uh, southeast. Sorry, Texas doesn't count. And uh, so, now one thing I learned in living in Texas: don't mess with Texas. <laughs> they, they, they'll, they'll get their "come and take it" banners out. So I don't know. I saw Texas up on the. On the well, uh, as <laughs> as a Virginia lawyer, I, I can very much appreciate being in the South. I I, I uh, live in an area where it's yeah. uh, right on the border with DC and Northern Virginia somehow just doesn't match with the rest of Virginia, but I appreciate being here in the South. So um, you've only been here a short time. What do you, what do you see as, uh, as the benefits in Atlanta and the region in, in general and, and what are the strengths for the medical device uh, community? Well, uh, you know, I think it's a great community. Uh, I think there's an element of cost of living um, that is strong. I think the sort of the midtown draw for the younger employee uh, there are now more uh, more medical device companies that are in our field that are here. We're not the only ones, certainly, uh, in Alpharetta. The university base and the, and the opportunities there, about 50% of our um, engineers in R&D are, are out of Georgia Tech, which is the top five engineering school uh, in the country. We're, we're able to do projects with them. Uh, we're able to consult with the, the professors. We have an intern program where at any given time we have three to five uh, engineers working with us. Um, equally, uh, Emory University, we are uh, working with them right now on, on Project P Prolong, which is a, uh, we're, we're looking at cool leaf and the mechanism of action and how long the duration of pain relief, uh, you know, would be there. University of Georgia has a, a really uh, strong, uh, uh, large animal lab. Um, and then if I think bro more broadly, just even outside of Atlanta, we, we, you know, I talked about Duke, we've got stuff going on at Wake Forest. Uh, I think University of Central Florida, uh, uh, you know, across, I think University of Virginia as well. Um, so just generally in the southeast, I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity. But um, I think it's also why a Atlanta was in the running for Amazon, and you see so many people moving to, uh, to Atlanta. What I've learned as a, s a CEO, though, is that your sort of employees that are in the earlier and mid-stage of their career get a little bit nervous about moving to an area that's not – Minneapolis or not Boston or not an area in California or New Jersey, New York area where if they have to make a career change for whatever reason, there's a number of companies there. But the more that we can bring and attract uh, companies into the area, I think the easier that dialogue becomes. Well, I think that University of Virginia is going to have a little bit of extra revenue now after last night to uh, <laughs> put into the medical field. So, uh, it fans for the Cavaliers out there? All right. All right. Good. Sorry for the Texas Tech fans or Duke or whatever. So uh, what changes do you think would help the region, the Atlanta region, take the next step to being uh, an even stronger world-class destination for uh, medical technology? So, so look, I think that, uh, that Jason is on to it with, um, we have to think of it as a region um, and get the states working together and not be so afraid if a company moves over to, uh, you know, they go to Raleigh instead of Atlanta or, you know, they choose another, uh, they choose Memphis. Um, and you know, for orthopedics or something like that, that that connection with the university, um, we're our experiences. We also formed an open innovation 
um, arm of our business where we're investing in smaller companies. We're seeing more of them come into play. I've had the chance to, to um, meet with some of the, um, those government officials in the state, like the governor. Um, I think if you get the state legislatures and the governor, uh, governors of the various states uh, engage with you and even have them go visit some of the CEOs, that might be thinking about um, expansion areas. Um, you know, you've got Phillips here now, Phillips Medical, um, and I think there's a lot of uh, digital-based uh, medical device companies that are um, that are forming in the Atlanta area. And so, you know, we just have to sort of, you know, get our microphone and, and project it a little bit. But in terms of what Atlanta has to offer for um, a medical device employee. I think it's I think it's outstanding, and, and they can get to the coast if they want to, uh, in in five hours or up to the mountains, and uh, and there's a lot that Atlanta has to offer. Well, I certainly like the real estate prices down here compared to uh, what we see <laughs> up in D.C. It's uh, it's terrible. So, being a patent person, I I'm not heavy into the tax area, but one of the uh, fights I understand you're in is uh, the f the fight against the medical device tax that was implemented as part of the Affordable Care Act, and that. This a, it's a problem that exists in the industry as a, as a whole. As a member of AdvaMed's board, um, you were very involved with the with the repeal. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in Washington with that? Yeah, you know, there's some good news for the industry. The the what's going on is the effort for permanent repeal of the medical device uh, tax. Um, and at the moment, there is a bill already uh, presented in the Senate um, and a willingness on a bar bipartisan level to pass uh, this legislation. And now in the House, 222 uh, members have committed to signing the bill. Probably in the next week or so, that's going to come forward on the floors. Um, again, it's, it's bipartisan. Uh, I think uh, it's not just a Republican-based effort. There's about 45 Democrats in the House that have, uh, that have signed up, and a lot of them have very important medical device companies uh, as constituents. Um, so that's a, that's a real positive, and I think it's going to uh, allow for ultimately uh, companies to, you know, as, as Avamed has been, has been articulating, invest more in R&D and bring some R&D back uh, to the U.S. So uh, as I understand, it, the tax is in a bit of an on-hold status. How does this affect your ability to plan your R&D and capital expenditures, your hiring? I, I think a lot of companies were going through that decision point of, um, you know, they were thinking about a lot about overseas, and they were, excuse me, overseas, um, and they were also thinking about should they invest. In, the ca in our case, we were in investing so little, 2 to 3% uh, R&D when, the, when the, the company spent out as halyard. We're now up to more like 6% uh, in total R&D, and we just found other ways, which we thought was so important to get that growth engine going in our business. But look, you do have to uh, cut some other things, and you have to make that commitment uh, to put that spend in and then manage that spend uh, and make sure you're getting the right return for it because uh, if you go three or four years and you don't put any points on the board, then that's no good either. Right. That, the pollen is uh, causing me to cough now. It started in the nose two weeks ago, and now it's moving to uh, – so be ready for that if, if you don't have it already. So you talked about growth. Uh, what do you see as the biggest challenges for mid-sized medical device companies um, – in the industry to, to grow or just in general? I think the big challenge is scale against the big players and there's been more and more consolidation and, you, and you've got to have a strong balance sheet. And uh, we're fortunate in selling the division that we sold at 650 million in revenue to have capacity to do up to 700 million uh, in M&A. That's a strong position um, to be in uh, so that you can sort of enhance the organic uh, growth with, uh, with M&A. So I think that that's uh, really important. Now, if you're a smaller company um, that's a startup, I think you've got to be you know, more focused on really making the product differentiable. Obviously, patent protection is really important in a portfolio uh, there. And uh, you've got to really think hard about you know, where you partner and what you do and what it takes today um, to build out a product and get it to $100 million or $50 million in revenue, the reimbursement battles that you have and the cost of building out a channel. Um, and those type of things, but uh, we've been fortunate because of, of divesting of a division uh, to have that ability to compete for M&A, and multiples are very high right now, as everyone knows, if you're in the field, um, and if you're going to compete as the, quote, little guy or gal, uh, you've, you've got to have a powder to do it, basically. Absolutely. 
All right, so if, uh, if you weren't in the medical device industry, what would you be doing now? <laughs> well, I thought that I wanted to be a journalist uh, when, I, when I started out, which is odd ending up as a CEO if you've got the thought of becoming a journalist. But um, what happened to me was um, I just I worked my way through school. I lost my parents when I was very young and uh, put myself through university. And so I started to get jobs that were more serious than delivering pizzas and washing dishes and uh, realized uh, the friends that I met uh, in, in college, uh, when you go home for the weekend or whatever, it was a, a different world, and that attracted me uh, at, that, at that time. So uh, uh, I think the big experience that was, that was really strong was going into General Electric in my early 20s, and that was during the days of Jack Welch, and there was a lot of training for us, a lot of um, understanding of business. Um, you know, there was a certain dynamic of, of the hiring process, um, and obviously, you know, this is an interesting discussion these days. There's, there's some, some negatives to the end of that story, but, but uh, for someone in their 20s to get that kind of training, uh, to be um, lucky enough, fortunate enough to be in medical devices and, and interacting with uh, surgeons and physicians, that's a good thing. Do you see companies nowadays investing the same way in employees like they did back when you were coming up? You know, I, I do. I, mean, I can say clearly at Covidian, uh, there was a there was a pathway for development, um, and it was a serious discussion, uh, and there was training and pathways and experiences. We're doing the same thing in our company. We just had a talent review. Um, we just had a couple of our um, employees go through assessments to help find out what they needed to develop if they wanted to become a general manager or they ultimately want to be a CEO. Um, we'd like to do a lot more of it. It's a little bit more difficult when you're when you're the six hundred fifty million dollar revenue company. Um, but we're doing what we can. And if you don't have the money to do it, the thing to do is to give people experiences um, and give them assignments that they can do that, that broaden uh, what they're doing day to day. I think the biggest part of that, though, is having the conversation with someone. You might be surprised because not everybody wants to make a change or, or keep you know, fighting up and, and growing, and others do. Uh, but it's important to know what they want to get the right plan in place. So my 17-year-old um, declared she's going to go to – University of Michigan for biomedical engineering uh, coming this fall. What would you tell a, a young woman in the engineering field or medical field uh, to look for in, uh, in a school or opportunities? I would say take the opportunity uh, that you can in the, in the summer breaks to get involved in an intern you know, program. Um, meet and talk to a lot of physician surgeons and, and you'd be surprised at what their contacts are into the companies and the relationships that they have and the doors that can be open. And it's always difficult for someone um, to make the move as a graduate into our field. But one of the easiest pathways is to start with a distributor like in orthopedics, as an example, where um, there's a willingness to you know, bring somebody young in, train them to scrub in, and teach them the, the industry. And then a lot of other companies recruit from those distributors eventually. That's a pathway that not everybody's aware of, but um, and it's a nice, it's a nice uh, rewarding position for a 22, 23-year-old. Excellent. Well, I appreciate the, the time. Yeah. Uh, I know that you uh, have a lot of other things to do as well. But, uh, again, my, my best to your wife and thank to your you. sister as well. Thank and, you. And uh, I look forward to hearing what comes next for you. Absolutely. And thanks, everybody. Have a great meeting. I appreciate it. Thank you.